Hello and welcome back to The Five Life. In this video, I want to share my experience of having a subchorionic hematoma in my current pregnancy. I will first share my personal journey of how I found out to what I did to help or increase my chances of having the hematoma result and what I would advise other moms that are currently experiencing a subchorionic hematoma that I wish I would have known for myself sooner. By way of introduction, I'm Jessica, and on this channel, we talk about motherhood, lifestyle, and videography. So if you like what you see, don't forget to like this video and hit that red subscribe button to follow along with our channel. Just for clarity purposes, a subcornea hematoma is when blood accumulates between the uterine lining and the chorion, which is the outer fetal membrane next to the uterus or under the placenta itself. So it's estimated that about 1% of all pregnancies have subchorionic hematomas. Sometimes bleeding is associated with that, sometimes it's not, but it's usually by ultrasound that you find out that you are diagnosed with one. So I had three bleeding episodes. The first episode from the subchorionic hematoma was when I was nine weeks pregnant. The second episode was just days after the first episode. And the third one was two months later when I was 17 weeks pregnant. Every time I bled, it only would last for about 24 hours, but each episode I felt like the bleeding was worse and I would experience more cramping with passing larger clots each time. So if you are experiencing this, there is hope for you. So I felt very fortunate and relieved to find out at my 20 week ultrasound that my hematoma was no longer visible on the ultrasound. Therefore, my hematoma was considered to have been absorbed by my body and no longer a potential risk to myself or baby. So just a heads up, everything I'm going to be talking about leads up to a good positive ending so far. I'm currently 25 weeks pregnant. I can't keep track anymore. So 25 weeks. So if you are watching this and you're panicking from your own current experience, I totally understand a glimpse of how emotionally exhausting going through all the highs and lows that a pregnancy with a subchorionic hematoma can bring. When I first found out about my subchorionic hematoma, I watched other moms' YouTube channels of them talking about their personal experience, which honestly gave me a lot of hope. So that is my purpose for today's video, to give you hope. For me, I felt like I was some ticking time bomb where if I moved a certain way or did too much in the day, I felt like it was going to affect my baby. So I can relate how you just, you just wanna protect your baby to the very best of your ability. Just know that most subchorionic hematomas resolve before the baby is born. The probability of you having a healthy baby is higher than losing your baby due to a subchorionic hematoma. So just don't lose hope. Okay, so with that being said, I'll rewind a little bit and I'll share some more details about my experience and I'll go into everything I learned through the process. There might be a little TMI in there, so a heads up, but I just want to be as candid and honest with my experience to help anyone else going through something similar. Going back to when I was nine weeks pregnant, we came home from church that Sunday and all of a sudden I felt like I had wet my pants. I then noticed I had blood on my dress and I instantly began just to panic. The first signs of a potential miscarriage is bleeding. That was the first thing that popped into my mind was thinking that I was having a miscarriage. I put a pad on, I laid down, and the bleeding continued. It became heavier, and I actually bled clots. So if you are doing that, it's okay. I was feeling uncomfortable, but it wasn't painful cramping, like you hear what happens with a miscarriage. So I just remember I just kept praying and praying and praying, begging God, please, 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 I would do anything to keep this baby inside of me, just over and over again. So I called my OB office, I'm grateful that my OB was willing to answer my questions, especially with it being a Sunday. 
and she told me that if I wasn't severely cramping, it was a high chance that I was having, or that I had, a subcoronic hematoma, which I had never heard of before up until that point. Thankfully, the bleeding stopped the next morning, so when I called the office the next day, I wish I could have just had an ultrasound ordered for me, but my OB suggested that I get blood work done to see if my HCG levels were rising as they should be or dropping, which was a sign of a potential miscarriage. So I got blood work done Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The numbers from the first day to the second day significantly dropped, like astronomically dropped. I couldn't get in touch with my doctor to confirm the numbers, but with numbers that far off, I thought there was no way possible this wasn't a miscarriage. So on Wednesday night, when we thought we were miscarrying, I just remember crying in Jared's lap, just feeling all the emotions. And we looked at the numbers again and decided to call the lab to verify the ACG results. We asked the blood work to be retested due to having such a drastic difference between the two results. And surprisingly, but thankfully, the blood test was inaccurate the first time. It put us on a roller coaster of emotions, but I was just so grateful that the retested numbers were in the normal range. So during this week, I was still having terrible morning sickness, where before the bleeding, I was just feeling pretty miserable with throwing up so much. But for this week, I thought I was miscarrying. I just remember feeling so grateful to be throwing up still because that gave me hope that I was still pregnant and that I was still carrying our little baby. With the blood work now reporting as normal, I had an ultrasound the next week. Today is October 21st, 2019. We are about to walk in to get an ultrasound of our baby. We've had quite the roller coaster and I felt kind of nervous. Just has had some bleeding and there was a scare that maybe we were gonna have a miscarriage, um, but turns out the lab results were, uh, there was a mistake done. And so the ACG levels have all been fine, but today will be an official, an official ultrasound. So it's exciting and also kind of unnerving with the circumstances. Our emotions have been so up and down, up and down. So my pregnancy symptoms are still very crazy nauseous and getting sick mm -hmm. and there can be a lot of reasons why someone might bleed during pregnancy the one you always worry about is miscarriage but there can be lots of reasons so we're hopeful and things look good that it's one of those other reasons and the ultrasound tech found a subcoronic hematoma so it was very frustrating because the ultrasound tech couldn't ever tell me the size of the hematoma I had to wait a few days up until over a week to even hear the updates. But I was told to keep coming back for ultrasounds to monitor the hematoma at least every other week and one time just one week later because I was considered to be having a high risk pregnancy. Every week the hematoma would show that it was growing. Um, one time it measured slightly smaller and then the next ultrasound, it drastically grew to the largest it was measured at. And that was 6.7 by 5.2 by 7.1 centimeters. This size measured to be 132 milliliters, which from what I have researched, the average hematoma is about 20 milliliters. So 132 milliliters, my hematoma was large, um, very large. I had a nurse practitioner mention how this was the largest hematoma she has ever seen and the longest she's ever seen someone carry one because mine didn't show it was absorbed until my 20 week ultrasound. So with that information to share with me, it made me panic. So again, if this is you, still have hope. I felt like I was abnormal. So I had a higher chance of miscarrying, which I may have. But again, no matter the circumstance or diagnosis, there is always, always hope for a happy, positive outcome. So again, I'm 25 weeks now, and the subcoronic hematoma wasn't present on my last ultrasound, but I did notice that I had some dull pain on my left side, 
which was where my hematoma was located for a few weeks on and off before I was cleared. I did do some research on that and many other moms experiencing this had the same thing and they thought that they were healing pains. So I'm not exactly sure if that was what I was experiencing, but a heads up if that is the same boat you are in right now. Going on to the second part of this video, what I wish I would have known. There is no clear answer or information like a one size fits all. Everyone has a very unique experience, different factors like the location of the hematoma and the size of it does give you different probabilities for your outcome. While most women have just one hematoma, sometimes others have more than one. I've heard anecdotal stories of someone's hematoma being cleared, but then a few weeks later, they'll go back for another ultrasound and the same one is back or another hematoma appearing that wasn't seen earlier. So some moms will bleed for their whole pregnancy, um, others for only a few weeks, others won't bleed at all. Some like me only have a few episodes of bleeding that only last 24 hours. So there are so many different factors that will play a role in your probability. But also every medical provider has a different method and what they think will help you have the most positive outcome. Some providers will recommend pelvic rest. Some recommend bed rest. Some providers will refer you to a high risk OB. Some recommend progesterone or other medical interventions to help increase your uterine lining. For me, I heard a lot of good things from taking extra ALA. It's a dietary supplement that a few studies have shown may help absorb subchorionic hematomas. So ALA is found in plant foods like kale and spinach, soybeans, and then some seed oils like flaxseed or canola oil, and then some seeds like chia, flax, and hemp seeds. The studies of it are so low, but a lot of them recommend taking 200 milligrams of ALA three times a day, and then some studies were saying to take 600 milligrams three times a day. So I was concerned with taking that high of a supplement because it wasn't thoroughly studied, and the side effects weren't really known during pregnancy. And I also read that because it was a collating agent, it bonds with mercury, which could remove the mercury from your body. But if the dosage is too high, it could pick up some of the mercury and then it would end up in your bloodstream. So after reading that, instead of taking the supplement, I decided to increase my dietary intake and I drank a fruit smoothie every night with lots of fruit and spinach in it, as well as chia, flax, and hemp seeds. So I'll link everything that I use in the description box below if you are interested to go check that out. I still took my prenatal vitamin every day, as well as adding in an extra vitamin C supplement, which I read may help the amniotic sac from premature rupture of membranes. And then I added an extra magnesium vitamin, which I also read may also prevent early contractions, which could be a side effect from a subchorionic hematoma. I also drank a lot of orange juice and pomegranate juice, which I read also may help subchorionic hematomas heal. So I drank like three cups a day. <laughs> so obviously so many different factors could have played into how my hematoma resolved. But in my opinion, it definitely didn't hurt um, adding in these dietary ALAs and vitamins because they are known to be healthy. And so I would recommend considering doing the same. I also was on pelvic rest and no vigorous exercise or lifting heavy objects above 25 pounds, which included my two-year-old. So we learned how to work around this. If she wanted me to hold her, I would just get down on her level and have her sit just on my lap. And then we taught her how to climb up in the car to get in the car seat for me to buckle her up. And then she learned how to walk a lot <laughs> just by holding my hand as we were in the store or just as we were out and about. So it definitely took some time, but it definitely helped. All right, I think I will wrap this video so it won't be too long. But again, if you are currently experiencing a subchorionic hematoma, don't lose hope. I cannot stress that enough. One Instagram friend who reassured me when I was on this roller coaster stage, uh, fearing for the future for my baby, she reminded me of the serenity prayer. 
It reads, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Oh, I think Brynn is awake. This prayer brought me hope, and I pray it's the same for you. I think we can acknowledge the things that we can personally do, like going to our doctor's appointments and ultrasound appointments. We can get second opinions. We can be our own advocate and do your own research and do what you feel is best for you and for your baby. And then just leave it in God's hands. And no matter the outcome, you can pray for strength and comfort and peace to endure this experience, but also enjoy the miracle that you have growing inside of you. And just to remember how it is such a beautiful miracle to be pregnant. Experiencing a subcoronary hematoma helped me to appreciate pregnancy even more. Um, in my opinion, I don't have very easy pregnancies, uh, just with the sickness and fatigue and weight gain. But this experience, it really taught me how life is so fragile. Um, but we can appreciate and be grateful for the gift that it is to carry a baby. And just having that spirit of gratitude can help replace that constant fear that I very well remember. So mamas who are watching this, I hope you find your peace and that you feel extra strength during this time. I am rooting for you. I wish you the very best for you and for your baby. Thank you so much for watching and for listening to my story. I hope you come back for more videos like this one. I hope to do more just talking videos with you and share my thoughts and experiences about pregnancy and motherhood. So thank you again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.